On episode 179 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet with Doug Hinch and discuss his book, Positively Resilient, Five and a Half Secrets to Beat Stress, Overcome Obstacles, and Defeat Anxiety. You can find the show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 179. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Doug Hinch is a certified executive coach, consultant, and corporate trainer. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's of education degree from Temple University. So, Doug, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Hey, thanks, Alan. Happy to be here. You know, you you have this this little red quote on the back of your book, and and I can't, it just just draws me in. It, It says, you can bounce back from anything. And I just, I'm sorry, I love that. I love that sentence, that just one sentence, you can bounce back from anything. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good catch. You know, it's funny, obviously, I had a lot of editing to do with the publisher, putting different quotes in different places and covers and everything. And that's one that I glanced over. So it's funny that, that and that's, I think, one of the central themes of the book. Alan, two things. First of all, context matters. We're all going to have different ways of being resilient and seeing difficult situations and how to get through them. But in terms of that, the meaning of that quote, I would say there is a ton of research behind it. I think we already are all very resilient. And sometimes, and some of the exercises in the book talk about just simply pausing when you're going through a difficult time and recognize that you've got, in a sense, some some crossover skills from something else that you bounce back from. And and don't think of yourself as, as inevitably failing, if that makes sense. I do. I do. And and I think there is a mindset and it's it's fairly popular. I've let myself down. I've I've let myself to this point. And and I and I know I felt that when when I was, you know, not as healthy as I needed to be and I was older and I'm like, okay, I was successful in one facet of my life, but I was not truly happy, truly successful. And so that, that's what I really appreciate about the way that this book kind of approaches things is you know, you can bounce back from anything. And and that can be from a physical calamity, that can be from a mental calamity, that can be from a uh, job calamity. And so it's it's really kind of a dynamic that really applies to what we're looking at with life, because as, as we age, we're going to be dealing with more and more stuff. Ooh, to, to, you know, tell me something I don't know, man. I, I, uh, so I'm 47 and I, it, it feels like the minute, and I, I'm a pretty active guy. I work out six to seven days a week, played college football and, uh, been around sports and working out my whole life. And uh, I know, I think the minute I turned 40, I, every tendon and ligament of my body decided to, you know, go into tendonitis shock. And there are certain things that we can do right to to turn the clock back. And I think part of it's psychological and part of it's eating and sleeping right. So when I was younger, it was kind of one of those weird things of when I first started my career and I'm in Jackson, Mississippi, starting with a, a, a CPA firm. And I find this club that has a breakfast every Friday called the Optimist Club. And so we would meet every Friday and we would have these conversations. Everyone, you know, every everybody would alternate doing a speech day. And so what I want to do is I want to take a step back and I want to get your definition of optimism because that was kind of the 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 tenet of each of those speeches that we would give is what is your definition of optimism? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. In my mind optimism really is a skill. That's that's the first element to understand in my humble opinion. And the reason I mention that is because yes, some of us are born with more optimistic thinking patterns than others. But it is something that you can build and you can get stronger in this area. And the thing is that it's a skill of, I'd say, focusing on the positive and not denying the negative and channeling your energy towards things that are controllable. And and the other thing about optimism is the term that I like to use is realistic optimism is the healthy 
one that I like. We can easily be overly optimistic, which we can talk about yeah, later. Because I'm going to win the lottery. You know, it's in Louisiana right now. I think what the power uh, the Powerball is like uh, 236 million right now. So I can be overly optimistic and and buy a whole lot of lottery tickets, but that's. That's not what you're talking about. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, the research is pretty clear that over being overly optimistic is a recipe for failure. It gets, gets you in a lot of trouble most times. So you have, you have a concept in a book, which I really liked, which basically said that by, by setting goals, you can actually drive optimism. So how does that work? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of research around goal theory and what that does for action and achieve, and how to achieve them and so forth. And what I've seen in people is that we can't, and the analogy I like to use in, in the workshops that I run in, in uh, corporations is imagine that you are a little league coach. Let's just say it's baseball for our for discussion. And um, your son is playing shortstop and a ground ball goes right to him and uh, goes right through his legs, right? So usually not that, you know, the coaches are pretty good. The coaches say, Hey, Alan, you know, you know, try harder or whatever it may be. Come on, Alan, you got to get that. But apparently, you know, the, the mom and the dad are, you know, clenching their fists. Come on, Alan, catch the ball. Come on. We, just like we taught you in the front yard. And the thing is, you know, Alan didn't wake up saying, I want to suck today. Right. Alan wanted to win. Alan wanted to stop the ground ball. And what we've got to do is teach Alan, spread your feet. Bend your knees, get your butt down, get your glove on the ground, get your right hand guarding your face. To give him simple skills. And I think that by achieving small goals every day, we are teaching them that optimism can come from and is more, more effective if it comes from our own success versus someone else telling us to just be positive. Just like we told little Alan, just catch it. That doesn't make any sense. And in fact, it backfires and, and can push people away from optimistic thinking. I was, I was listening to a podcast, uh, strangely enough, I listen to podcasts, but you know, they were talking about mantras and they said that the best mantras are actually mantras that are not just affirmations, but that are affirmations based on something you've done. And so it's, it's more of a, I know I can be healthier because and that because statement is is where you really lay down the groundwork of because I've you know committed to eating better I've bought better food you know I've you know read this book I've I've done this thing I've listened to this podcast for example but all those things of saying it, it's not a I'm good because my dad says I am. You know, Alan's not good because he was told he was good. Alan's good because Alan practiced. You know, Doug's good because Doug showed up and did the work. And when you when you take that that positive affirmation and say, I know that's true because I did this, then it, it really just adds power to the the nature of what you're actually accomplishing and really makes it true. I mean, in your mind, it is true because you have done the work. Yeah. And it's, it's the, you're, you're the best example of your own optimism, right? Where you were able to do it and you were able to feel it and do it. Eventually mom and dad aren't going to be around to praise us and, and tell us what to do and how to do it. You know, and I, you know, one of the other things, uh, my guess is that you've got a couple of parents who pay attention to your, what you're talking about. And one of the epidemics I see in our society is that we're doing all these participation tro trophies and we're trying to get our kids to just feel good about just showing up. And I think we've got to get them feeling good about winning and feeling like I need to try a little harder when I lost. Well, that, that's going to be a tough one. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I don't know that I'm going to be around long enough to, uh, to actually see how that all plays out, but you know, unfortunately, we were raised, we, I know, we were raised with uh, the whole deal of you accomplish what you accomplish. So if you've done something great, then, then revel in it, you know, use that as the fuel to, to be a better you tomorrow. Because in the reality of things, you know, you're the only one you have to make you better. No one else is going to step up and say, okay, you're a better person. You really have to step up and say, okay, I have the optimism because I know what I've done. And it can be a small thing. It, it, it can literally be a, I went a day without 
X, or I did this to, I did my first workout today. And, and those little, those little accomplishments seem kind of small, but if you look at it from an optimistic perspective of it's a lot better than it was the day before. Yeah. And you know, here's a funny story for you, Alan, is that I had one of those Samsung Note 7s, right? Luckily, my phone never exploded. I never had it on well, fire. Thank God. <laughs> I loved it. I, I was I was absolutely, I, I, I'm going to say tug-in-cheek depressed for two weeks after I had to hand it in. And I had a big decision. Which phone do I want? And this is going to sound funny. Like I said, I went and got the Samsung Edge 7, I think, S7, right? And the reason I did it is because Android has widgets. And I have an app where I track how many steps did uh, I did I get my step goal for the day? Did I did I um, keep myself under 15 grams of sugar for the day? Did I keep myself under six carbohydrate six uh, servings of carbohydrates? Okay, I want I want everybody to stop right now. Okay, I want you to hear what he's saying about sugar and carbohydrates. Okay, Th- that's important. That's an important caveat. Okay, let let's let's not lose that fact of that's that's important. Okay, but but go ahead, Doug. I'm sorry, I do. Well, I, well, you've got the <laughs> disclaimer that Doug is not a nutritionist. This no, works. no, no, he's not. He's not. But Doug, Doug's taking care of Doug, and I'm going to acknowledge that Doug's taking care of Doug. And if you do the same thing, you're going to see good things. I'm not a nutritionist either, but I can tell you, my clients that do what Doug's doing are seeing good things. So that that's that. Okay, go ahead, Doug. I'm sorry. And, and that's that's the thing is what we're really talking about when you know I can click on a widget on my phone. That says, yes, I worked out. I got my step goals, sugar, carbs, whatever it may be. I do Gracie Jiu Jitsu too. So every time that I either watch a video or get to class, just to just to just to nudge myself. And there's a new concept that I've been toying with lately, uh, based on a podcast I listen to, is this concept of incrementalism. The big changes and the big victories that we've had as a society, whether they be technology, literally getting to the moon or civil rights, all followed the same path of incrementalism. You cannot figure out when it's 1960 that how to get to the moon in a day, right? It took us a decade. The same thing with the civil rights movement. It took us decades and little victories along the way to start helping our society turn the corner. And I think the same exact thing applies to us is as you know, Alan, right? I go to the I go to the the gym and eat right for a week or two. Depending on my body type, I might not see the exact changes I want to see, but I'm gonna feel better and I'm gonna feel that sense of accomplishment. And it's about momentum. We keep that momentum. We're in better shape for the long haul. Yeah, and it's inertia. I mean, you know, once you start moving, it's easier to move. When once you start doing, it's easier to do. If you sit still, then you're stuck. And so, you know, if, if, if it's an app, if it's, if it's any kind of tool, and they also have those with iPhone, just by the way, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is what I do. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you on a Mac. I'm sorry. I'm, but anyway, they have these tools and they have these things and you can use them and you can use your momentum. You can use what you've done to be better. And it's, it's really just a matter of, of that first step, that first step. Thing. And, and that's what I really like about your book is it really talks about just getting started. Yeah, little things that make sense for you, for your values. And re- remember that these are at your disposal, optimism and pessimism. Neither one is good for you. Neither one is bad for you. There are times when you should be worried. You should be anxious. And the more resilient we become, we start to recognize that in between, you know, stimulus and response in our lives, we get to choose. So should I be worried that my son hasn't called and he's, you know, two hours late driving home from college? Well, maybe it is time, you know, or does this happen every time? So maybe I shouldn't be worried because he does this all the time, right? So we, we are told that winners never quit and quitters never win. But of course, you have a different spin on the whole quit. So could you share that? Yeah, I I look at it the same way as optimism. It is a tool in your arsenal for being more resilient. Can't tell you how many people I've run into who are running their parents' businesses because their dad wanted them to. Or they are in a marriage because they feel like they're going to be hurting people by getting out. Or they're in a profession because they're 
kind of worried about how much money they're making and what this will look like within their circle of friends. And some of the happiest people I know were people that took steps back financially, moved out of dysfunctional relationships and quit to figure out what was best for them in their lives. Hey, look, we, we get one shot at this. We get absolutely one shot and time is all we really have to spend. It's, the, it's it. I don't think we have money. We don't have anything else except time. And what you decide to do with it is one of the most important decisions you could ever make. And we, we do it every day. And it might be that the job you're in, the person you're with are not the right things for you. This is why identifying what your values, what are your most deeply held values? If you know those well, decisions become a lot easier. And then quitting isn't quitting. It's learning and moving to the next thing. Yeah. And it's funny because I, I think what, when I play Monopoly, the, the, the hardest decision for me is to make sure that I get the dog because I like to be the little dog in Monopoly. But you know, so many people will play a game and they'll quit because they're losing the game. But in life, we're not losing the game. So we have to figure out ways that we can win the game. But at the same time, quitting something that's not working might just be the open door to something that's winning. Absolutely. I, I love that. And in fact, uh, I mean, there's there's lots of examples, I'm sure, that both you and I could share. And we there's there and it's let's let's be honest, it's a very difficult stigma in our society be, to quit something, to quit anything. But it's when we recognize it's our life, our lives, that holds a lot of power. Well, and I'll share this. I'll share this. I, I've told this story here before, but I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper. You know, I was 37 something years old. I, I was, I had everything. I, I had a great career, you know, working corporate, doing well. And my company was really struggling and then it got back on its feet. And, and I worked really hard to help make that happen for the company I was working for. But the, the people I, I was working for after it was over really didn't fit me morally. And the relationship I was in at the time was not good for me or anyone around me. And so while I was, you know, I, I had all, all I wanted from money perspective, you know, the, the making it in a career perspective, the whole rest of my life was a complete train wreck. My health was a wreck because of the stress and, and just not having the time to take care of myself. My relationship was in a wreck. And, you know, in, in fact, I could say it was a good job, but it, it was only a good job from a title and pay perspective. It was not a good job from a managing my life and, and actually, you know, having something that I felt like I was doing good in the world. And that was the breaking point. Now, it took me a long, long time to like dig out of that. But I can say is I quit all of that. I literally quit that job. I quit that relationship. I quit that lifestyle. And over time, built in the good things. And had I not quit those other things, I would not have been capable of taking on those better things. Oh, no doubt about it. You freed yourself up and you were true to your values. And, and maybe a big part of the meaning and purpose you get out of this podcast is sharing your mistakes and your failures with others so that they can not make the same ones. They can make all new ones. And that's what I'm saying right now. I'm, I'm, I'm completely at what I want to do. I want to do this. I want to take care of people. I want to give them information. I want to help them find a way to find their health and fitness. And so, yes, this is exactly what I want to be doing. And so every fiber of my being is saying, okay, let's make this happen. I have a very supportive wife. I have a very supportive family. I have a very good foundation in what I, where I am. So everything's working right now because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but I couldn't have been doing it if I weren't willing to quit first. Yeah. And, and in fact, in my coaching practice, Alan, I will, uh, you know, and, and I didn't really have the opportunity to write about this in the book and maybe this is in the next one, but it's about the role of meaning and purpose in our lives. When we can say things like I'm going to get in shape, not only for myself, but so that my kids can see me, you know, so I can meet my grandchildren or I can be a great grandfather, great grandmother, whatever it may be. But when we attach ourselves to higher meaning, things outside of ourselves, 
we increase motivation as well. It, it, it's in the workplace as well as I believe in any type of health and fitness. Absolutely. And that, and that's the word I use. I use the word the commitment is, is just as you, just as you, when you get married and you make that commitment and that emotional feeling. And I know you can look back at, at, at your wedding and say, okay, I remember that day. You'll always remember that day. If you made that kind of commitment to your health and fitness, you'll always remember that day and you'll always be true to that commitment. But it's it's the same it's the same emotional. This is what I have to do because I need to be there for my grandchildren. I need to be there for my spouse. I need to be there for my family. I need to be there for me with the self love that I have for what I can contribute to the world. So when you really start putting that all together, it really is about commitment. Yeah, love it. All right. So so maybe that's your next book, commitment. <laughs> uh, and I gave you the word because that's what I use here all the time. And, and, and everyone on the podcast will tell you that. But anyway, so Doug, I want to thank you for being here. And I always want to be able to tell people where they can get more information about you. So where would you like me to send them? So uh, my website's probably the best place to go. DRH as in Douglas Richard Hench, drh-group.com. And I am messing around a little bit on LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, so you can find me. My handle's uh, at Doug Hench, and just putting random posts up and just tips for people to be better at achieving their goals and being more committed now is what I'm going to be focusing on. So again, this is going to be episode 179, so you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 179, and you'll find the links to Doug and all that he has to offer. And this again, this is an awesome book. It's uh, resilient, uh, positively resilient. And again, thank you, Doug, for coming on to 40 Plus Fitness. Hey, thanks, Alan. This was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, would you please share it with a friend, family, or colleague? Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness podcast, I give you 11 reasons to lift weights. Until then, have a happy and healthy day. 